Hello, everybody. All right. So, Dennis will be here. <laughs> He's running a little bit behind schedule. And, but he will be here. I apologize for that. I had water in here. Um, so before Dennis gets here, let me, let's talk about, I have one question I have to answer before he gets here. And, but while we're doing this, let's talk about, while we're waiting for him, let's talk about what this is so that we don't have any confusion when we get here. This is not an interview. I would like to do another interview. I did an interview with Dennis a long time ago that I transcribed. And I think it's still online. I don't remember. Um, and, but no, this is not an interview. I, I, what we want to do here is have you guys ask questions and um, that you would like to know from Dennis about uh, trumpet, about jazz, and about um, music in general, right? And what else? What am I? So let, while we're waiting for Dennis, let me also introduce him. <laughs> He'll be here in a couple minutes, I'm sure. Um, Dennis, I first met Dennis when he was a judge and a, a performer for one of the jazz festivals at UTEP, University of Texas at El Paso. And let me make sure this is loud enough. And what else? So he was a, a judge and then they had a concert with the judges participating. I'm trying to see. And anyway, so that's the first time I met him was in, that would have been the early 80s. And then later, when I moved to Houston, I think the first time we met in Houston was at a jam session. And uh, it was at a place called the Washington Show Bar. And Dennis was one of the hired horns. But it was a jam session, which that's kind of unusual, right? Because usually if it's a jam session, they don't hire horns. They hire a rhythm section to play behind the people who are jamming. But this, if I'm not mistaken, this was actually a hired, he was a hired horn for that. And, um, yeah, so that was the first time we met here in Houston. And after that, so we kind of, I don't want to say that, that, um, how, how am I trying to say this? So that was the first time. And then after that, him and I, started playing on gigs together. Mostly big band gigs, but there were other types of band, gigs too. I just yesterday did a uh, informal video recording session with Ricky Diaz. And uh, Ricky was the first big band leader that the two of us had uh, worked with together. I, I played a bunch of gigs with Ricky Diaz, big band, and Dennis was the, the jazz chair. It was Buddy Sisko on first, Dennis Dotson on the jazz chair, and I was playing third part. And for those who are just now getting turn, uh, coming on, uh, Dennis Dotson will be here. He sent me a text, said he's on his way. So I'm not exactly sure how long it would take for him to get here, but he is um, just running a little bit late. Okay. So, so yes, Dennis and I played in the, 
Ricky Diaz big band, and then we played in the Ed Gerlach big band together. And then since then, we've done a whole bunch of jobs together. We sometimes now play in uh, the Richard Brown Orchestra together. Hello, Javier. Nice to see you. Yes, I'm doing good. And, yeah, so the two of us. Now, one thing I wanted to say about Dennis, and it's kind of good that maybe he's not here so that he doesn't. Yeah. Because, you know, my compliments always turn out to be, like, not so complimentary. I don't know why that is. I think Dennis has is the most beautiful jazz player. If I had to pick a single word to describe Dennis's playing, I would have to use the word beautiful. And I'm when I'm talking about... Um, I'm talking about uh, his improvisation, right? We've said that many times in the uh, in the Q and A that we're talking mostly about uh, uh, improvisation when we say jazz player, and he's by far, in my opinion, the most beautiful jazz player uh, out there, I, and I mean in the world. You got to hear his playing. All right. So let me answer some questions while we're waiting for Dennis. AC, AC, hello. He asks, are there tonguing exercises in the tonalization studies book? The, technically, no. It really should be slurred all the way through. However, there's nothing wrong with adding articulation if you want to add articulation. So it's great for tongue slur combinations okay or do so his second question is or do you have a separate book with tonguing exercises so the tonguing exercises are in all of the books that have my routines in them so the tonguing exercises are going to be in the daily routines book they're going to be in the chops express book and then the individual chops books, those all have articulation exercises. Now, Maya, hello, Gabriel, nice to see you. We're still waiting on Dennis. Um, I appreciate you guys' patience. You're going to enjoy when he gets here. <laughs> so, Javier says tonalization must be slurred. Um, I, I prefer that they are slurred all the way through. Now, sometimes on the upper notes, some students, because if you're doing like a, a descending arpeggio that ascends, you might have to slur up a sixth. So I don't mind the students tonguing those big intervals um, just to get the, the, the accuracy. We still want to strive for something that is slurred on all those notes, okay? Um, Gabriel says, Eddie, can I make tonalization with double tonguing? So, like I said, you know, you can, you can modify those exercises any way you want. So... <laughs> Right? I just did it wrong, but you get my point. And, or you can do, so that that's a three note pattern. We wouldn't want a double tongue knot. We could triple tongue knot, but you could do the four note, four note pattern. Right? You could do that. Um, but what I would, let me tell you this. In my history, in my past, I thought, hey, consolidating exercises would be a great idea. It would be a great time saver. And I did that for in the early 90s. Um, 
consolidating exercises. So the way I'm thinking about it, I'm getting the double tongue and the tonalization studies done at the same time if I do what you're talking about, right? Um, it's not so good. If you think about the psychology, about the mental side of what we're doing, when we're doing a, a exercise, the, the whole point of the exercise is to focus on one thing about the trumpet. Consolidating exercises is great as a as a um, over and above thing to do, like to push yourself to the next level. But as a rudiment that you do every day, I wouldn't recommend it. it there's no rule against doing it. But my, and maybe your reasons are different from my reasons. For me. Um, it was to consolidate and save time. And, uh, oh, Dennis is here. <laughs> and so give him a minute to walk up. Let me finish questions here. Javier says, when, when I do tonalization, sometimes I try to the whole key in one breath. Is that okay? I, I like doing that too. Yes, the whole exercise. I like doing that too. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to have Dennis, because I promised Dennis some coffee. I'm going to ha uh, have Dennis introduce himself. I wouldn't normally do it that way because that's kind of rude. Um, I realized that after the last guest we had, it was rude of me to introduce, have him introduce himself. I should have introduced him. Um, but I kind of already introduced him. Dennis, and I want to make sure I get him his coffee, <laughs> right? Um, so I'm very excited to have Dennis here. You guys are going to love it. He's such a great guy. And here he comes. Okay, guys, hold that thought, and we'll have Dennis right in. Go ahead and sit there. When you're trying to find a place. So there's no numbers. Yeah. So what are we doing here? So uh, this is the QA. Everybody, this is Dennis. Oh um, right, now, are, right now. Right now there's not a, a lot of everybody, but yeah. um <laughs> <laughs> but it does get what what we do here will still be on after we're done. Oh I see. Yeah. Okay. So um I promised you coffee. Why don't you tell you them about you what do you want milk? Cream. Oh, no, no, I don't want to dilute the caffeine. <laughs> That's just funny. funny. <laughs> well, as I get your coffee, I'll, I'll let you guys, let you tell them about yourself. I already said some stuff, but. Oh, okay. 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 Well, I'm just an old trumpet player who's <laughs> still trying to keep it going. I'm from a small town in East Texas. And, uh, I first started working in Houston, uh, stayed here for a couple of years. Uh, actually, when I first started, I was still in college, about 70 miles from here, and we go back and forth. And then uh, I left Houston, I moved to Las Vegas and was there for five years. Um, played the house bands there, uh, left there and went on the Woody Herman band. I did that for two years straight. And then uh, when I left that, I went to New York City and I lived there for a short while, a few months. And uh, they called and asked me to go back on the road. So I did uh, for another eight months or so. And then over the next two years, I stayed in New York, uh, went back on the road a couple of times to fill in while they were trying to find somebody, try to save a little money eventually ran out of money and came back to Texas. So I ended up back in Houston in 84, and I've been here ever since. Uh, 
I got into teaching private lessons um, at Houston Community College. I did that for quite a few years. And then uh, they hired me to teach some private lessons at University of Houston. Did that for a while, five years, I think. Um, and then I got the call to do the same kind of thing, um, teaching jazz trumpet, essentially, at University of Texas in Austin. So for the next 14 years, I did that. I would drive over on Wednesday night, teach on Thursday, and then drive back to Houston. Um, I stopped that in... 2018. So for the last three years, I've just been here in Houston freelancing and uh, collecting my pensions. And uh, I have about seven students I teach on Skype. And that pretty much brings it up to the present. All right, man. Yeah. So let's see. So just to make it clear, oh, f first of all, let me know, guys, if you guys can hear, because I want to make sure that's all right. And then, other than that, I want to set one rule today because we have we don't have Dennis here every week, so I don't want to answer any more questions about my method. Okay, <laughs> so we can <laughs> wait. That we can save all those questions for. But another I had week. a few questions. <laughs> <laughs> so um, and so please don't be offended if I skip your um questions if they're about my method. Okay, um. So, Gabriel says, hello. Hello. Um, Javier says, greetings from Chile. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Nice. Um, he asks, where can you listen to your music? Uh, hmm, that's a good question. There's a bunch of it on YouTube. If you put in my name on YouTube, you can find a lot of stuff. Uh, covering a broad span of years and a broad spectrum of groups, small groups, big bands, a uh, number of kinds of things. I would say that'd be your best bet because although I did uh, several albums with Woody Herman, they're not available anymore. They're all out of print. So YouTube is probably it. So there's some albums that I would recommend of yours. And you can tell me, Oh, I don't like that. Oh, okay. <laughs> so the first album I bought that you were on was Return to Wide Open Spaces. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's, boy, that's way back there. Okay. I forgot. That. So that's, that's quite an experience. So who was, was that? Lockjaw? Uh, no, it was it was uh, uh, Fathead. Oh, Fathead yeah, Newman. David Newman. So that was, and um, Ellis Marcellus on piano? Ellis Marcellus. Uh, James Clay on tenor, uh, Leroy Cooper on baritone. Um, don't remember the drummer's name. I never ran into him again. Um, Chuck Rainey on bass. And uh, there was a fine blues guitar player did a couple of tunes with us too. I can't remember his name. It was, uh, was an interesting. interesting and then... Thing. um. One of my favorites that you're on is... That one, incidentally, was a live album oh, at, okay. at the Caravan of Dreams in uh, Fort Worth, which was a really nice jazz club, uh, long since gone. Oh, the okay. side. Yeah, but that was a live album, and I got on it strictly by accident. Somebody, the guy who put it together was in Austin. They were trying to find Oscar Brashear. Oh, okay. But uh, they couldn't find him, and somebody recommended me, and they hired me. Nobody had ever heard me play. Oh, and really? So I don't know why in the world they well, hired me. Well, good thing they did. Oh, I was thrilled to get to play <laughs> with, with Fathead and James Clay. Those guys are great players, Great or were great players, unfortunately. Yeah. Gone now. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. So then there's the other one that the guys did at Cezanne. Um, I know Joe was on the gig, but the Bass player from Dallas, Adams. Oh, John Adams. John Adams. That was a great scene. Fly by too. Night? Yes, Fly by Night. Oh, well, I'm glad you liked it. It was at... Uh, uh, I thought it was at Sedan. No, it was at the place in the Rice Village. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Ovations. Uh, ovations? Ovations. Okay, yeah, I didn't know ovations. that. Uh -huh. I thought it was Sedan. Yeah, we traveled with a, with a quartet that John put together for a while. Yeah. Yeah. That That's... 
the waterfront. We did. That's, a I think that's my favorite. Oh, great. Okay. I didn't feel very good. Yeah, about, you told me that. the way I That's why I said you can say uh, Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I felt like my chops weren't, weren't working well, and I remember very well I could not hear myself in there. It's a very, uh, it's a very reverberant room. It's very boomy. And I was just buried. And I kept trying to get some help from somebody, and no, nobody offered any. Right. So it was hard work. Right. Fortunately, then, we knew the music because we'd been playing. And then there are a bunch of albums, like you said, that are not available, but I'm just going to mention them just because. Okay. Um, I love the album that you did with Norma. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I just played a couple of tunes on there. Yeah, but I love mm -hmm. the solos you did on that. Great. Thank you. Um, and in fact, I oftentimes quote you, if I have a uh -oh. tune that Look starts... Really, that's me? That's you. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder where I got it. <laughs> huh. I, I haven't listened to that for a long time. There were a few things that I did just a track here and there mm -hmm. that I was pretty pleased with. That was one. Uh, there's also a track I played on uh, uh, Kelly Gray's album, another singer. Uh -huh. Kelly Gray, Tomato Kiss, uh, played a solo on Speak Low. And uh, the great pianist who lived here in Houston way back then, named Dave Catney, did an arrangement for it um, and used a lot of al altered uh, alternate chord changes. It was really uh -huh. a challenge to play on that. But that I enjoyed. Um, we also did an album here in Houston with the, uh, the singer Bob DeRoe. Oh, that's another very good one. And I played two uh, two tracks on that. I, also, I played on a few tracks. I also like that too. album that you did. This is a wonderful album. The guy in Austin. This wasn't too long ago, right? Three years this, ago? This uh, Gato 6. Yes. Uh, yeah, I was just going to mention that one. Yeah, I was I was very happy with that one. I was very pleased with that one. And the, the overall album was beautiful. It was difficult, difficult music. Way, the way George Oljay is who you're talking about. He's the piano player who wrote the, wrote all the music. And uh, instead of the chord changes moving in typical fourth and fifth fashion, uh, half steps and such, George had them moving in whole steps. So you'd play a bar here and then you're down a whole step. You're back, you're up a whole step. It just, they, they had strange movements. Wow. It was really hard to get that together. We recorded it in his house. He'd oh. already laid down the rhythm section. So um, it afforded me the opportunity to try to, some stuff to uh, go yeah. back and fix some things and also just uh, be uh, more relaxed because there wasn't the urgency the of having it right, right uh -huh. now. And I got to say, we played that band live a bunch of times and I never again even came nearly oh. close to uh -huh. playing as well as I did on the album. But yeah, I was pleased with that. It's called El Viento. El Viento? El Viento. El Viento, yeah. Hello, Anthony. Nice to see you. So ACAC is a high school student that switched from... Tell me if I'm wrong, ACAC. He switched from tuba to trumpet. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, moving up good, in the world. Good, good moving or not. <laughs> moving up, yeah, that's for sure. Moving up Frequency-wise. Yeah, right. <laughs> and he says, um, need to darken his sound for concert season, but all lip slurs and long tones do is make my sound more clear rather than darker. What else should I do? try? I play lip slurs and long tones daily. What do you think? Oh, uh, hmm. You'd probably have better advice than me, but I would say that would be a product of mouthpiece or horn or both, a combination of the two. But a lot of times it's just it's just thinking that way. I know this sounds real esoteric, but uh, uh, if you can get a good middle-of-the-road mouthpiece, then you should be able to play bright on it when you need to and play dark on it when you need to. So, AC, AC, why don't you tell us what mouthpiece that you're playing on? 
sometimes it takes a while for them to respond. Yeah, I understand. Um, so, sorry, Anthony, we're going to skip that for today. I'm sorry. Gabriel says, first of all, congratulations uh, congratulations for your great career. Thank you. Talking to you. Maybe it is a silly question, but I'm not English. Gabriel is from Italy. Oh, no kidding. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. I'm not English, and I've been always very curious on what the trumpet clinician is. Thanks a lot for your reply. A clinician. Well, really just... If you give a master class, uh, that's colloquially called a clinic. You know, it's not a uh, trumpet clinician can be anyone who comes in and does a master class and talks about how to do things. It's, so basically like teaching, but uh, in a, almost a classroom sitting? Almost classroom. Well, instead of private lesson. I suppose so. Yeah. 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 Or, or instead of private lessons. Maybe yeah, I, would, I would say to a group of people. In the English system, they would call you a lecturer. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. If it was out of outside of music, like my wife uh, taught physics at the university, mm -hmm. and they called her position a lecturer. lecturer. I see. Okay. So, and, and. Yeah, that's. Right? Yeah. So. I'd say that makes sense. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm not even going to try to pronounce that. <laughs> Where is jazz most alive today? Where is a good place to get started as a jazz amateur? As a jazz amateur. Ooh. I wonder where he is. Uh, where is jazz most alive? Uh, there's still a lot being played in New York. I think most any big city has some. Um, it seems to me that most of it is underground. There are guys getting together and playing, and they're playing in little little fly-by-night places that come up and then close and come up and close, you know, or try jazz for a couple of weeks and decide they want to do something else. So um, the schools, of course, are keeping it li alive. There's uh, there's jazz bands at every university in the United States, probably. Um, but there's always players. Uh, here in Houston, we're a big, spread-out city huge city. Um, there is jazz here, but maybe not as much as in a, a city that's more compact, more dense. Um, I'm particularly thinking of Austin, uh, where I taught uh, at the University of Texas. That's a really good school. A lot of guys come out of University of Texas and just decide that they want to stay in Austin because it's a cool town. That's right. Um, and boy, they're, they're, really fine jazz players everywhere there on every instrument. It wasn't always that way. I remember back in the 80s, uh, there were just a few. But there, there's an active scene there. Uh, the town is, is uh, fairly liberal in regard to the arts. So it's a pretty good environment to be able to experiment and do something different. Right. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, it'll stay alive. It'll stay happening all the time because musicians love to play it. It's challenging music and it's fun. Uh, but now your question, what was the part, second part? Uh, how does an amateur get started? Now, I don't know whether he's start? talking about an amateur getting started playing or an amateur. I would assume playing. Well, that's a good question. Right? Mm -hmm. Playing, I would say the first thing to do is gather together the biggest uh, collection of recordings you can and keep adding to it and listen, 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 listen as hard yeah, as you can. Absolutely. Try to figure out what you're hearing. Uh, transcribe solos, transcribe uh, melodies, transcribe everything you can think of. Anything that you have the slightest curiosity about, sit down and figure it out. It's painstaking. painstaking. Uh, to some people, it's like pulling teeth, but it gets easier and easier and easier. So you do that, and then I recommend playing along with the records. There's a lot of, uh, I'm dating myself there, but with the recordings. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of, Jamie Eversold's got all these great play-alongs, and they're backing tracks up on YouTube, and plenty of, of uh, 
access on the iReal Pro. I use that in my teaching all the time. There's plenty of access to play along material, but the best play along and, and use it, sure. But the best play along material and the best way to learn tunes is by playing with the actual recordings because mm -hmm. there you're hearing the big boys play it. You're hearing what they do. If there's a chord change that in a certain spot that is kind of confusing to you, you're not sure what to do, go directly to the recording, see what they do. Right. Steal it. Steal it. <laughs> it's not really stealing it. You know, there's uh, one guy said that, uh, I forget who it was. I thought it was a great line. I always remember it. He said, uh, I don't live in a vacuum. He said, "There, I don't have an original thought in my head. Mm. You know, so there you go. You uh, you have to learn. Miles Davis said, when you start to learn jazz, you have to learn a lot of cliches. And what he's talking about there is that you have to learn the kinds of things that everybody plays and put those in your vocabulary because otherwise you won't sound like jazz. You've got, you've got to know uh, the elements of the style and you have to know all the things that go into the elements of the style. And those things are, are, could be called cliches because everybody does them. And that's true of any style of music you want to learn, any style. So that's how I'd say to get started. As far as getting started playing, you get out on the scene, you listen to people. Uh, if you can go hear them live, go up to them and speak to them. Tell them how much you enjoyed their playing. Uh, everybody likes to hear that, everybody. And more often than not, they'll take some time with you. Don't be a pest, you know, but uh, go over, up and speak to them. You do that enough times, they'll, they'll recognize you. They'll see you coming. You say, what do you, do you play anything? Yeah, I'm, I'm a trumpet player. Yeah, well, uh, like here you play sometime. You know, why don't you uh, s come sit in one night? So uh, sit in when you get those chances. The idea is to be on the scene and get everybody to know you and let them hear you play and let them know that you can play. And then they'll start calling you. Yeah. yeah. So that reminds me of a... so. In August, I decided I'm spending too much time making videos. So I said, I'm going to put aside all my time for videos and get them all done for the rest of the year. Wow. <laughs> so I have videos scheduled until January 1st. My goodness. For, these are the Wednesday night videos, right? Okay. Uh, Wednesday, Wednesday morning. And I have a series that's coming out, I think, next week. Mm -hmm. I think next week. No, probably the week after. It's on listening. And it's eight videos long, two two months worth of videos. Okay. And I talk about being part of the economy. Oh. Uh -huh. Right? Being part is like what you're talking about here. Um, and I even quote, I think it's Monk. You know, you've seen the, the, the sheet that someone wrote down, the Monk's Rules. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Right? I and he says, that. don't ring me for a gig. Right? Be on the scene. Be on the scene. That's exactly <laughs> what I'm talking about. Don't ring me for a gig. Be uh, on the scene. Yeah, be on the scene. Mm -hmm. People start to recommend. Uh, people start to recognize you, and they start to recommend you. That's what. Right. Yeah, that's what. Right. And I'm sure that's. I know that's how I got into business, and how I've gotten all my work. I, sh I assume it's it's the same with you. Yeah. So uh, my first jam sessions um, were when I was in high school. And my high school, I couldn't drive, but my high school buddy um, used to take us out. Did you ever meet Ricky Malachi? No, I don't think so. Drama. So anyway, um, but that's how I got into the scene. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I didn't play as much as I listened, right? Yeah. And I would ask them all kinds of annoying, pestering questions well, on the breaks. And they're probably not that annoying, you know, nobody... Uh, I'm just saying. I, my experience, you know, yeah. My experience, <laughs> people don't mind. You know. But um, but yes, and, that, that, I, and I think that's that's very similar to what you're saying. I, I, being not having a car, I couldn't just go to a concert. But I'll tell you yeah, what. Yeah, me either. There was a, a trumpet player in El Paso, a, a blind guy, played just like Roy Eldridge. Mm, wow. And wouldn't stop. Right, like on a on a, a more modern gig, mm -hmm. still plays like real oh, well. <laughs> right? And, who you are. And, 
And uh, but you know what I appreciated appreci appreciated about him was that he was like my little time capsule. Mm -hmm. And I because he was blind and because I was so um, shy, I guess would be the I'm I'm a hardcore introvert, right? So mm -hmm. I don't go introduce myself to people yeah, and stuff really like that. Sure, yeah. But um, I would just sit in the gigs and 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 listen to him play and watch his fingers and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And I really got a whole bunch out of just being there. Yeah, sure. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. And what I found out later when I did finally start communicating with him is the guys would whisper, him, hey, man, Eddie Lewis is in our audience. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. <laughs> so cool. but yeah, I think you're right. I think you have to be just like what he says in Monk's thing. You have to be a participant. You have to, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, or at least an observer. And then you become a, a participant. Right, right. Well, you know, that's what thing, I mean by participating is go to the clubs and listen mm -hmm. to these guys. Another thing is if you hear somebody you like, ask them if they teach. Ask right. them if they do lessons. Absolutely. If you if you can hook up a teacher who's an established player in any place that you happen to be, any town, um, you know, he can he can uh, tell you what you need to do. He can work with you on it, and when you're ready, he'll start spreading the word around. That's how I got my first job. My teacher at Sam Houston University recommended okay. recommended me for a steady job down here in Houston, and uh, uh, so they tried me out, and I did okay. And uh, that's that's really how I broke into. Oh, that's great. I was already doing one or two little gigs here with some what we call weekend warrior dance bands, you know? uh -huh. but not much, not much. But after I got that job, that was a pretty high profile job. And I stayed on it for, I believe, nine months. Wow. And after that, you know, my name was established. That's right. Yeah. So who was on that gig? Do you remember? Uh, yeah. I remember all the guys very well. Uh, the lead trumpet player was a great player named Bill Patterson. Oh. Bill Patterson had been, on Tommy Dorsey's band, done a bunch of other things. I don't remember what, but he was, uh, he was a really fine player. Uh, the uh, second player was Victor Reyes. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it was, a, it was a smoking trumpet section. I initially went on the job playing second. There was another guy playing third. Um, and I went on the job playing second, but I was so green. I didn't know what I was doing. I could play the notes, but stylistically it wasn't right. And if it came time for a solo, I'd jump up and I'd, you know, I'd try to try to really, really lay it down when that wasn't the thing at all. It was uh -huh. a, it was a dance band. Oh, you know? I see. And we split sets with shows. So we'd, we'd play a dance set, a show, a dance set, a show. Um, and that would take us up to 12 o'clock. So... I was just kind of hanging on for dear life on that that, wow. that job. Um, but the third player who will remain nameless, he imbibed a little too oh, much. Oh, I quite, see. Quite uh -huh. a bit too much. And one night in the job, for we, we have no idea what happened. He just freaked out and he ran away. Oh, wow. He just left. So... There was a guy playing in the lounge upstairs, and they brought him down to play the uh, the show. Hector Guerra, do you remember him? Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. Caprito. Uh -huh. They called him Caprito. So Hector came down and played the show. But he had he had a steady job upstairs in the lounge. So, um, so by that time, Victor had come to town from Corpus Christi. And he was looking for work. So they moved me over to third and they put Victor on second. And I had no trouble holding down the third book. So that was the trumpet section for a while. That was the first really fine wow. trumpet section I ever played with. That was great. Wow. It was at a private club called the Cork Club. Wow. 65. And 65? 65. Wow. I was 19. <laughs> All right. So... Javier says, Mr. Dotson, in your opinion, what makes for a good trumpet player? Wow. So many things. And everybody's so different. You know, um, basically, you have to have a decent sound. you got to play in tune. Um, you have to have good enough technique to tackle the music that's presented to you. And uh, that's really where it starts. Um if 
if you get a good sound and you have decent, decent technique, you'll probably have good endurance, you know, because it means you'll be playing correctly. Um, then everybody's different. One guy is has really good high range. Another guy has a beautiful sound. Another guy can play really fast. So it, you kind of fall into whatever it is that uh, that you're wherever your talents lie is what I'm trying to say. Um, but a good trumpet player, well, you know, uh, standard stuff, good sound, good technique, good pitch. I don't know. It's about all I can say about that. Uh, I think there's a lot of um, uh, debate about what what would make a, a good player you know what I mean? Because there's some, like what you said, where you have those different strengths and different weaknesses, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Um, I think a lot of people disagree on those things. Oh. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like for example, and as an exaggerated example, those no, guys who, ahead, who I... only care about high notes. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> right? yeah, well, there's a lot so, of those guys. You know? And, guys. and so anyway, yeah, I think, I think, when it comes down to a, what what makes a good player, um, I think being able to uh, match the right product to the right customer. Well, that's a that's a good point. Yeah, you you really in this business, you need to be fairly versatile. You need to be able to cover a bunch of different things, and um, of course that. He, he asked about trumpet playing. That's not strictly trumpet playing. That's, right. that's, that's the business and, and knowing how to deal with music. Um, another thing I would say is you need to be a good section player. You need to know how to follow, uh, follow a lead player. If you want to be a lead player, then you don't need to know how to lead. It's not a matter of just sitting there by yourself and, and uh, waiting for the high notes to play in and uh, playing sloppy and weird before that. A lead player really sets up the uh, – must must play within the style of the music. Right. Must play within the style of the music. That's and, why they call uh, him the lead player. That's what they call the lead player. He really – he he has to lay it down. Uh, and you have to do it the same way every time so that the guys can follow you. A section should be – really a whole band should be – like the hands of a piano player. You know, you got a four trumpet section. Um, it should be like the right hand of a piano player. Um, and that they're all doing the same thing at the same time. And they're all getting basically the same kind of sound. And uh, they're all playing the same volume. So, so you got to learn how to blend in a section. So, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm shocked sometimes when I go to some of the schools, and which I don't do often, but it does happen, mm -hmm. I'm shocked that they no longer teach, at least at the schools I've seen, not, not all of them, but, but enough to shock me, <laughs> mm. is um, they don't teach the kids to listen to the lead player. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And the whole point of having a lead player is to have someone to set the style. And if, you know, you don't have... In my the way I understand it, you don't have the the conductor saying, hey, it's "Third trumpet, I want you to make this note short, this note long, get no, out right, of here." No, right? right? That's from the lead trumpet player. Mm -hmm, yeah. The yeah. third guy listens to the first guy. Yeah, exactly. And and takes mm -hmm. all of those stylistic things from mm -hmm. the example set by the lead guy. That's right. And that's it just right. shocks me that that's not being taught. Hmm. I wasn't that, I wasn't aware it wasn't, but it is extremely important. It's just, you know, it's it's uh, it's part of playing in a band. If you're not playing by yourself, then no matter if there's only two of you, you've always got to be aware of what's going on around you and what everyone else is doing. And uh, it, it, then it needs to become a group effort so that you're all working together towards a common end. Right. Well, right. That's the way I feel about it. All right. In in Las Vegas, when I lived there, it was full of lead trumpet players. You never saw so many lead trumpet players. <laughs> I didn't know and, that. Oh yeah, and, <laughs> and a number of them are, are quite famous now. 
uh, there were other guys who were just as good, whose names you never heard. Okay. Who, if you heard them, they would just knock you out. Well, I couldn't do that. You know, I didn't have the chops to do that. But every band needed a third player. Right. See, so I worked all the time. Had no problem. Well, I see what you're saying. You know. Uh huh. Yeah. I mean, it's just um, there's a value in knowing how to do that. I've heard people talk about great fourth trumpet players, you know, who, who've made a real uh, career of playing good fourth trumpet. They not only knew how to follow, they had the proper equipment and the proper sound to give that bottom to the section. Mm -hmm. And they took it very seriously. Right. That was the thing in Las Vegas. If you put one of those fine lead players on the third part, he might not take it very seriously. Right. You know, wouldn't be any fun for him. You know, but uh, right. anyway, okay. Yeah. So Gabriel says, Mr. Dotson, can I ask if, as a famous trumpet player, there's a big difference playing in small group or in orchestra? What do you like more? Thanks. In orchestra, I assume you mean big band? Yeah. I'm, I, yeah. Yeah. He was just talking inside, like combo or yeah. Other group. Yeah. Which one do you like more? Yeah, there is a big difference. Um, I don't know. Um, I don't think I can I can say that I have a preference one to the other. I think for the early part of my career, I played mostly in large ensembles, and uh, I began to get a real desire to play in small groups. So I got kind of tired of big bands, but uh, it's not really that way now. You know, I, I think uh, whichever one you happen to be doing the most, you may yearn to do the other. Um, they, are they different? Yeah, they're quite different. Um, the uh, Playing a small group, I'm not doing any reading. I love to sight read. I always enjoyed sight reading. And uh, if I'm may modestly say I'm pretty good at it. At least I used to be before age came up on me because my eyes are not as good as they, as they once were. But uh, I love to sight read. I love to play in an ensemble and sit there and try to follow the lead player and try to be part of a section. That's great fun for me. If I'm in a jazz band and we're doing that, a lot of times I don't care whether I solo or not. I'm quite happy to just sit there and play a part because I like being part of the team. Um, then on the other hand, you get into a small group, there's an entirely different kind of responsibility. Uh, that being mostly solo uh, improvisation. It's a different kind of trumpet playing involved too, because in the big band, you play a little bit, you rest a little bit, you play a little bit, you rest a little bit. In a small group, you play if you can, pretty long solos, and then you stop and you stand there and you wait for everybody else to play. I've discovered in, in all the different kinds of trumpet playing, there's different requirements re regarding endurance. Right. Uh, hardest thing for me is brass quintet. Uh huh. Because you don't ever get the thing off the chops, and I just can't do that. <laughs> Not good at that at all. Then you look at orchestra players who have to sit there for uh, multiple, multiple, many, many, many bars waiting to play and then come in and it must be right now and, and just right, perfect, boom. That's a whole other kind of plan. Right. That's a whole other kind of endurance. You find that a person who's good at one might not necessarily be so good at the other. Physically, I'm talking about. Right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's quite different between playing in a, in a large, uh, big band and playing in a small group. But that's fine with me. Um, I like playing shows. I like playing in that kind of big band, not just uh, not just jazz bands. I can get sick of it. That's why I left Las Vegas. We were playing um, in the house. I was playing in the house bands there. Each band, each hotel in town had a house band that consisted of six brass, five saxophones, piano, bass, drums, guitar percussion, and generally a 12-piece string section. Imagine that. Wow. 10 or 12 hotels with bands that size. So musicians were working all over the place. Wow. There was so much work. It was incredible. Um, we would play a show, an entertainer. We'd back an entertainer. They'd come in. 
they'd play um, two shows a night, one at eight thirty, one at eight o'clock, and the other one at uh, twelve. Really? Eight, eight and twelve. Yeah, we'd have oh. a two and a half hour break generally. Um, come back and play at twelve. So you played two two shows a night, six nights a week for a month. That was their standard pay uh, stay. Uh, and uh, let me tell you, that got old. <laughs> that got old. I don't. I can believe that. You know, you by the by the end of the first week, you essentially have this the show memorized because nothing changes. It's exactly right. the same. Right. You essentially have it memorized, and you still got three weeks to go. So then a new one comes in. You go through the same thing again, and maybe another one. And then that first guy comes back or gal comes back. Well, now it's memorized within two days because it's still right. the same stuff uh-huh. you did before. Uh-huh. And uh, that eventually drove me crazy. That's why I had to get out of those fairs. Okay. But I generally, I do enjoy the challenge of playing shows. Um, it used to be that entertainers, they still do it a little bit, but not very much. It used to be a lot of entertainers who would come into town and play at a theater in town. Uh, a band would be put together would rehearse in the afternoon, play the show that night. That would be it. You know, and it was a real challenge to put the thing together in one rehearsal. And I thoroughly enjoyed that. Don't get to do that much anymore. That's Some of those shows experience. now, the ones that we still play, still play the same tune they did. Mm. Like you do the Temps and the Tops, and it's the same oh, yeah. charts. Yeah. That, like for 30 years. <laughs> yeah, well, they get stuck doing their heads. People expect to That's hear them. right. When That's I was right. on Woody Herman's band, he was still playing Wood Chopper's Ball in California. Uh-huh. You uh-huh. know, and that went back to the 40s. And here it was uh, nearly 40 years later. Uh-huh. And he was still doing that stuff. But people expected it. So, so I I was introducing you before they got before you got here. Oh, okay. And I said that. Sorry, I'm late, guys. Oh, Traffic right. in Houston sometimes just defeats you. So, um, I told him the first place we met was when you were judging in El Paso. Oh, is that right? That's right. That's not my first memory of you. <laughs> I wasn't. I, uh, so, like I said, I'm a quiet guy. I don't. Um, um, but yes, that's okay. Okay, that's the first time I was very impressed with your um, because you guys played the, that night. Yeah. And I was very impressed with your playing that night. Boy, I, I don't. I don't remember. I, I do remember being in El Paso and, and doing something for Sam. Jazz, yeah, Jazz Festival. Hmm. Okay. My first memory of you was at a club over in the Heights. I was playing a job with Malcolm Pinson, the drummer. The Washington Showboy. Is that, yeah, that's yeah. it. That's it. And you, <laughs> you sat in. I thought, oh, wait a minute. This guy can play. <laughs> Yeah, I remember that well. I remember your exact words. What? You said, you, you, after we finished playing, you apologized to me. And you said, I'm sorry, man. I thought you were some punk kid. Oh. <laughs> you mean I didn't treat you with respect? <laughs> no, you were very respectful. Oh, that's funny. That's funny. <laughs> well, that's what you would expect. You know, it's rare when, when a really fine player walks in and, just is there, and you go, you, oh, okay, something new. <laughs> so, all right, let's see what else we have here. Gabriel says, one more question. If yeah. possible, when you make improvisation, do you, sir, every ta- ever take something from classical music? Most likely. Uh, not on purpose, but I think you take something from everything you've ever heard. You know, you really do. Uh, it may be by the time it comes out of your brain and into your horn, it may be completely transformed. You know, uh, remember when Joe Henderson came to the uh, came to U of H? Uh, yeah, I missed that. I was played. Well, it. he was there twice, but he played a concert over at University of Houston, and I went over to hear him play. And he played this long solo and something. And all of a sudden, he quoted. The ballerina dance from Patricia. Oh, okay. I went up to him after his over and I said, Man, you played that? He said, Oh, you heard that, did you? I said, Sure, I'm a trumpet player. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, you, 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 
you use bits and pieces of everything you've ever heard. Uh, like I said before, um, I don't live in a vacuum, you know, right. it essentially to me, um, it's very rare you run into a player who seems to be a total original. Um, and I don't think anybody is a total original, but to me, improvisation is largely a matter of cut and paste, you know, cut and paste. You listen to some of the alternate takes on some of the great albums, you'll find that whoever it was, well, an example is on uh, Clifford Brown, Max Roach at Basin Street, one of my favorite albums. Uh, Clifford Brown plays this just absurdly great solo on uh, I'll Remember April. And when the CD came out, they had an alternate take. And I listened to the alternate take. He plays the same ideas, mm -hmm. but they're in a different order. Right. They're in a different order. It was really funny. It's, a, it's not the same solo. It's the same ideas, but the order is different. And uh, I guess those were just his cliches, his ways of getting through the chord changes. Right. And then it came together on one better than it did another. And that happened to be the solo that they used. It's a magnificent solo. If you've never yeah. heard it, you should listen to it. It's really something else. Yeah. All right. So Anthony says, no, Anthony lives here in Houston. Okay. Um, one of these days, Anthony, we're going to have you over here. And uh, <laughs> I, I said the local guys eventually will have them sit in that chair. And, and, you know, even though they're the, so not the same as like what you're doing. Yeah. But, but, but um, because I think the guys who are regulars would like to meet each other. Sure. That, that way, makes sense. Know? All sure. right. So Anthony says they want me to play Third trumpet most of the time. I like second, but I play third because that's what they want. You know, I guess third can be harder sometimes because we will be filled in between. I think he's responding to what you were talking about, the lower parts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. You get typecast. And that's a difficult thing. I, I'm not, I've always had a little trouble getting beyond that. You know, if you if you play nothing but third, they may think that that's all you can play. They may think you can't play second. Right. So if you play second, they may think you can't play lead, even if you can. Right. You know, so it's, I don't know, that's hard. That's, I don't really know what to tell you about that. I always just take what comes to me, you know. Um, I don't like playing fourth particularly. But I don't mind playing third in a jazz band. That fits my range uh, perfectly. I used to play second with the jazz project band. You remember Noe's band? Uh -huh. I did a lot of second playing there. I can't do that anymore. My range is not as good as it used to be, nor my endurance. Um, but uh, I, you know, I don't know. I can't. I can't tell you how to break out of that, Anthony. I wish I could. Um, you'll get opportunities later what what age is he i have no clue are you in high school oh, college, no he's a, a he's professional a, he's a, a adult oh okay oh, okay um he's playing with one of the community bands oh i see oh, okay okay yeah i don't know you might ask the second player to throw you a couple of parts you know he's a student of misaki of uh what -huh. misaki misaki is it, what, what, uh, what is Japanese that? girl that plays trumpet in town. Oh, yeah, yeah, I've met her. Yes, I know yeah. her. Okay, okay, great. I think that's her name, right? Misaki? Um, I might be... Well, if you I hope asked, I didn't just stick my mouth in my Yeah, if you had asked me, I could have told you. I know, I know you're about. <laughs> She plays with that uh, that blues band that James that's uh, right. Williams used that's to play right. with. Uh -huh. Yeah. Nish Nishidati? No. no, never mind. Never mind, we're massacring. <laughs> Gabriel says, there. that's unfair. I live on the other side of the world. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's Misaki. Okay. Anthony says Misaki. Yeah, yeah, I remember her. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, you guys got any more questions? I'm glad you could do this. 
It's fun. It's fun. I'll hang here as long as you want. As long as they want. So I have questions too, but I would okay. like to... So I'm I'm starting different projects right now for mm -hmm. the for the videos. One of them is going to be very casual, very very casual interviews. Uh -huh. um, I don't want them to be typical interviews like like um, what mock piece do you play and, yeah. and yeah. who did you play with and stuff like that. Uh -huh. I want it to be more like a hang. Uh huh. Sure. And kind of like what we're doing now, except that I'll be the one, you know, not not taking questions. It won't be live. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I'm waiting to get one of those before I start that. Uh -huh. the, the nice camera. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> so yeah. so um, that's quite a rig. So um, well, I, you said she's playing with Conrad Johnson. Then. Oh, I didn't know she was with Conrad. No, I didn't either. Yeah. Did you ever play with Clement's band? I did for a okay, while. Good. Yeah. Uh, when he was still alive, I did. Yeah. Just a little while. Just a little while, a year or so. Yeah. Yeah. He so. was uh, quite the fella. Quite the fella. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant musician. Uh, and loved. Well loved. His guys in his band just worshipped him. Right. You know, it was amazing. And that's still going. Yeah, probably right. is. Yeah, they've, they've probably got, is. Like, so his legacy is that he's got this high school reunion band, and then he's got his big band, which is still going. That's the one they're talking about here. Yeah. And then they have the um, Connor Johnson Institute. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no better. So that. he's talking about. Leaving a legacy, a musical legacy behind. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Plus yeah. a movie, right? He's got that video. I don't know. Thunder Soul. Oh, I, don't, I haven't seen that. There's a Thunder Soul documentary. Oh. If, if you guys want to check it out, uh, Thunder Soul is the name of it. And it's a documentary about um, the influence that, that he had as a high school band director. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he definitely left a legacy in, in Houston. He certainly did. No doubt about that. And and to to, to what what to me what I find remarkable about that is he was musically speaking, he was a giant. Yeah. Socially speaking, he was a, a humble. Yeah, he was. I, I don't want to use the word little because that that, that sounds derogatory, but he wasn't Famous is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, people knew him. They knew of him. But he you wouldn't see him on TV. You wouldn't see him, you know. There was no... no well, that's true. He didn't do a lot of promotion stuff. Right. That's what I'm saying. Uh -huh. and, and so for someone who... So when you see that as a legacy, in my opinion, that's because of... The impact that he had on the people, yeah, yeah, the, in their lives. I remember when I first started playing with him. I call, I, I, I didn't know who he was when I got back to Houston. It was some time before I met him. But I first started playing with him. I was calling him Conrad. And one of the guys turned around. He said, "No, no, it's Prof. Prof. <laughs> prof. For professor. Yeah. So they didn't, nobody called him Conrad. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah." Um, do you, sir, play other wind instruments? No. <laughs> I have enough to do dealing with this one. <laughs> Anthony says she played with... Oh, yeah, we already saw that. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. All right. Yeah. All right. So, guys, we normally quit at this time, but we will stick around if you have questions. So, um, when I was in high school, when we had study hall, uh, they, they'd have a period they call study hall, a period in which you didn't have a class and you were supposed to go in the library and sit and study. And a lot of times I'd blow that off and go down in the band hall and uh, pick up some other instrument and play. So I learned saxophone fingerings. I, oh, okay. I played with sax, played, played saxophone, and I learned saxophone fingerings. But I couldn't play well enough to even play in our high school band, much less 
do a gig on it. You right. Know? So no, I don't. I don't, I don't play any other one. Of those. So you know what? I almost forgot. What we had a question before the. So I do open it up and let let people contact me beforehand. Okay. And I forgot to answer his question. Okay. <laughs> what do you think about heavy caps? About what? Heavy valve caps. Oh, um, I, I myself, I don't like them. I don't like a lot of metal metal on a trumpet. I know that's all the thing, all the rage these days. Um, I understand maybe why guys do them. Um, I experimented with them a little bit. I had a uh, one of those Marvin Stam French Bessons <clears throat> for a while, and it came with with a set of uh, heavy caps. And I noticed that when I used them, it focused the sound. It focused the sound, uh, made it more compact and more centered. And it seemed like it would go that way, you know. Well, that's a good thing to me. But uh, it also darkened the sound a little bit. And I've got a lot of hearing loss through the years. I tend to prefer for myself a brighter sound. That's strictly personal, strictly personal. Well, uh, I, I had some students at UT who were playing big, heavy uh, trumpets, Taylors and and mm -hmm. Austin Winds and uh, a couple of Lawlers. Not that not that those are all heavy horns, but they make some really heavy horns. One guy had a really heavy Selmer. I don't remember what the name of that model okay. was. They have a lot of metal on them. That, I believe, comes from Monet. Um, right, he started all that. Yeah, maybe he picked it up from the idea of the heavy caps. But I remember kind of before Monet, people were taking metal off. Oh, yeah, okay. Right? They were taking these little knobbies off and take the... the yeah, uh -huh. right? well, they were styles to... and ideas of how you want to sound changed drastically through the years. But anyway, these guys would play and their sounds were fine. You know, they were centered and in tune, big, fat, and dark. But I'm thinking, how can you blend in a section like that? Mm -hmm. I don't understand. I heard Terrence Blanchard play at uh, University of Houston. He did a master class in the afternoon and I went to it. And there was nobody there. It wasn't attended. But he played with the rhythm section without a microphone. And he was playing his Monet, and he had this thick, dark sound. And, man, that thing filled the room. Mm. I'd always been taught that for projection, you need a little brightness, you know. But but uh, there, Monet was definitely on to something regarding uh, projection and sound. It just was never how I wanted to sound. And that's that's the same thing with adding uh, heavy bottom valve caps and and megatone mouthpieces, mm -hmm. you know. It just wasn't how I wanted to sound. I, there's nothing wrong with it. Obviously, it has its advantages, but uh, sound should be a very personal thing. It shouldn't just be a genetic thing that you get, you know. Okay, I play trumpet. Well, what's your sound like? I don't know. I, don't know. Mm -hmm. I played once when I was in college at a jazz festival in Austin, and we backed up Kenny Durham. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. Kenny Durham came down and and uh, did a concert with us, and uh, played some charts of his. So we had a rehearsal. At the end of the rehearsal, I was standing over backstage, and the band director grabbed Kenny and he brought him over. So Dennis, won't you meet Kenny Durham? I was like, oh my goodness, you know, I don't want to stand in there shaking my head and shuffling <laughs> my feet. I have no idea what to say. And uh, he realized that he was a super nice guy. And he says, Hey man, he says, what kind of horn you got there? And I said, well, it's a so-and-so, you know, but what's the mouthpiece? <clears throat> and I said, uh, it's, it's a Giardinelli. I just got it. It's, it's a V cup. I said, it, it plays pretty good, but I'm not quite sure. I don't think the high notes are quite as easy. He says, Oh man, don't worry about that. He says, the main thing you want to know is, does it give you a warm sound? Hmm. And the light bulb goes on as a warm sound. I didn't even know I was supposed to get one. <laughs> warm sound. You know, my goodness. Wow. That's, that's a good it, story. Yeah, that's one of those moments, you know, where somebody just says something off the top of their head that changes your life. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Warm sound. 
And I had to admit, he said, does it give you a warm sound? I'm like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> so Gabriel says, if you were going to play in a duo, what would the other instrument be? Oh, drums. Wow. Or piano. Or piano. Or guitar. Um, yeah, yeah. Could do it with bass. But uh, I think drums would be my first choice, probably. Wow. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't, if we're going to play tunes, you don't have any business playing a tune you don't know. You know, so if I know it, I don't need somebody laying the chords down. So just, you know, let's, wow. just, let's just play rhythm. If it's a trio, everything changes. The drums would be the first thing to go. <laughs> well, no, well, no, that's not true. That's not true. I'm going to change that. The trio would either be bass and drums without chords, or it would be chords and bass without drums. I can see that. Because with yeah. the trio, the bass would become the background, the important thing to me. But a duo, probably drums or a chord instrument. Or accordion? Chord. I'm instrument. just kidding. <laughs> Definitely not a chord. In fact, I'm going to play a trio tonight with a singer. Uh, so she's going to sing, you know, the tune, and then it's me and the guitar player we play. It's just doing oh, wow. it like that. So wow. that's fun. Okay. So where does the word jazz come from? That's from Gabriel. I don't think anybody knows. Don't think anybody knows. A lot of jazz musicians don't like the word. Uh, they think it uh, it has negative connotations somehow. Uh, I, I can't answer that. I don't know where it comes from. I have something I tell my students, and I tell them I don't know how true this is. Yeah. So I tell them um, as a almost a philosophical way for them to put their head in the right place for uh -huh. jazz. Uh -huh. And you might not even this might even not even agree with this, but um, I tell them, and I don't even remember now where I got this from. But j jazz used to be equivalent to our F word. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, it does have a, a connotation there. It does. It is. Yeah. It, so it, I tell them that that um, because we're talking about like the the controversy of jazz. Because uh -huh. when jazz first started, it was extremely controversial. Yeah, that's true. And I said, if, just to give you an idea of how controversial it is, this is a spiel I give all my students. Uh -huh. um, just imagine coming up with a, a style of music today called the F word. Yeah. Right, and those people back then were a lot more like prim and proper than we are today, you know. Yeah, so, probably. Yeah. so uh -huh. it was that's why they called it the devil's music back then. That's part of it, yeah, you know, uh -huh. because it was so. Um, a lot of it had to do with the venues that the guys right. had to play, too. That's right, and since it began, it began in New Orleans, you know, um, and uh, there were a lot of brothels where guys played. Right. You know, so it got it became associated with that kind of thing. Uh, but you know, the farther time-wise, the farther we get away from that those or, origins, the less it becomes. The, the less that connection between those things is there, and it yeah, becomes right. more what we have today uh -huh. is an art. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, mm -hmm. and a, and a lot of people come to come to the jazz clubs and hear us play, they're not necessarily well-versed in, uh, you know, in the music. They don't necessarily know the history or all the, the great practitioners, but they get something out of it. I used to think, well, now what, what is it that they're enjoying, you know? And uh, I believe they can see there's a certain virtuosity going on sure. and that there's a certain intellectualism going on sure. that appeals to them. You know, so uh, it does have that that uh, that thing attached to it that it's an intellectual music. In a sense, it is. In a sense, in a sense, it is. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's. I'm discovering recently 
This is pretty amazing that we could play jazz, white jazz anyway, in um, situations in venues where 30 years ago it would not be uh, not be allowed. The band leader wouldn't allow it. No, you know, don't do it. Don't be doing that. You know. <laughs> uh, and now we can we can go ahead and stretch out a little bit, and people seem to like it. They wow. really do, and it it uh, it's never ceased to surprise me. The singer that I'm singing with, she I mean that I'm playing with, she uh, she does a really nice repertoire, mostly from tunes from the Great American Songbook, Broadway tunes and movie tunes, the things that jazz players like to play as standards. And she's just always done that. And I mentioned that to her a couple of weeks ago. I said, you know, not too long ago, we couldn't get away with playing the way we're playing. Right. And so, oh, really? You know, didn't occur to her. She just went ahead and did it. And when she did it, everyone accepted it. So, hey, great. That's fine. So I think that's a real positive thing. I really do. Now, if we could just get people to come to the clubs, you know, what I'm talking about is playing restaurants. And I remember like 20, incidental music. I remember 20, 30 years ago being told that if we were going to improvise, that they'd still need to hear the head in the solo. Yeah. That it's just that an embellishment of the head. That doesn't surprise me. And that, that's something I have a, a lot of difficulty with, <laughs> you know. But that's because of my background. Yeah. I come from the... the, the the whole traditional jazz education background. Yeah. I don't teach you that. Uh-huh. You know? Yeah. You were a huge influence on me. I used to not oh, play right. any, any, uh, when I played the head, I didn't want to play any extra stuff. And I thought it was gimmicky. And, uh, and then I heard you do some of that. Adding some bass notes, some maybe some trailing off bits and stuff like that, mm-hmm. and I thought, "This is heaven." Oh, okay. You wow. Know? Well, and great. You're, you're the one that I'm changed flattered. my mind about playing the head just straight and flat. Yeah. And uh-huh. Definitely. I try to maybe embellish it a little bit, but not that much. Right. You know. Uh, and I think that's why it spoke to me. It was because I didn't okay. like any of that. Oh yeah. Okay. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. I really get, uh, I really get bugged with people who, who, and I, you know, I'm not putting down singers, but singers are the ones who do this all the time. <laughs> Sing a tune, and just change everything about it. Well, then why sing it? You know, um, my feeling is that most every tune <clears throat> has a couple of weak spots, uh-huh. and if you can improvise something in there that that improves those weak spots, fine. If you have the, uh, the uh, intelligence to do that, but otherwise leave it alone, mm-hmm. leave it alone. You know, some, especially if it's a, an established good tune, some great composer sat there and poured all of that and worked on it to get it just perfect. And then you come in and, and uh, uh, change it all. It doesn't make any sense. If you can improve it, do it. If you can't leave it alone, play it straight. That's the way I feel about it. So talking about that, um, in this series that I told you about, where we're going to do uh, eight videos on listening. That sounds great. So the the one video is on what I call on the gig listening, Mm -hmm. which I think is the ultimate. I think that's, I I tell, and I've been telling people this for years, the, the best listening you can do is being on the gig with someone who knows his stuff, right? Someone old. And yeah. so, you know, I, and I talk about you in the video. Oh. As one of the like people it. that, that oh. you know, at, with no matter how many hours of Freddie Hubbard I've ever listened to, Clifford Brown, Charlie Parker, any of these jazz greats, no matter how many hours I ever listened to those in my lifetime, will never equal the influence that you had on my plan. Oh, my goodness. Wow. I'm flattered. That's how I see it. I'm flattered and humbled. Wow. That's how I see it. 
And um, but really, if you're open, you learn from everybody. You know, uh, as I said before, uh, speaking of trumpet, that one guy has got this strength, another has that strength, another has that strength. Same thing in improvisation. It's the same thing with style. Right? It's the same thing with everything, really. If you if your ears are open and your mind is open to accept it, you can learn from anybody. I mean, I've learned a lot of stuff from you too. I, I, you've you've influenced my concept of of uh, a number of things, especially trumpet playing and sound, and you know. So that's such as that. right now. I can't I can't even fathom that everything that comes no, out of my true. horn right now. I'm like. This sounds awful. <laughs> no, no. I listen, I listen to you play, and I think, man, I wish I could do that. You know, I really wish I could do that. I played once with a fella in Austin named uh, Pat. Uh, I forgot his name. He's a good trumpet player. Uh, we played a concert together, and I mentioned to him, I said, man, you know, I said, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not centered my pitches very well. I'm, I know it's getting in your way. He looked at me with an astonished look on his face. And he said, wow. He says, I was just sitting here thinking to myself, Dennis is centering his pitches so well. I better get to work. <laughs> that was strange. That was strange. You never know what you sound like anyway. You I told know. my wife this morning, I said, you know what? I, I sound like crap now. There's, there's, I think it was my one. No, it might have been one of my students. I had talked earlier today. And um, it's like everything that comes out of my horn repulses me right now. Yeah. yeah I've every, been time, that. every time I've had periods of like that in the past, it was right before a growth spurt. Yeah, 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 it would be. Mm -hmm. Someone told me a long time ago, said uh, they, they were speaking of improvisation. So they said, when you reach the point that that uh, or you get into the the mindset that you don't like anything you hear and that that you're stuck and stale and you can't come up with anything new he said that's the learning period because what's happening is there's new stuff in your head that's spinning around and you're digesting it and all of a sudden one night on the job it'll just come out and suddenly you got a breakthrough right. and i've experienced that a few times i think he's right you know so I understand what you're talking about. It's yeah. it's hard to get through those times though, when you just you just right. can't stand it's, yourself. It's demoralizing. Yeah, it's very demoralizing. Mm -hmm. So, yesterday I did a a photo shoot with with Don and Galveston because I don't have any promo fo photos with the oh, beard, yeah. uh -huh. and I, I I want to do more leader stuff. Yeah, and I thought you know if I have promo sh shots that don't have the beard. And I show up with the beard. They might, they might not say they were ripped off, but you know. Well, no, I know what you mean. You, beards you, attract different people. Yeah, you don't want to misrepresent. Rid of the beard. Well, that's true. That's <laughs> you know, true. so you got a point there. Um, mm -hmm. So we have my wife shoot some. Some she took thirteen hundred photos. Oh my <laughs> Down in wow. Galveston, wow. Um, and so I had a string tied onto my slide because I got the, the, the horn fixed, had some dent slides and stuff mm -hmm. like that, but also gave it a, a, a chemical bath mm -hmm. and the stupid thing won't stay in. Oh. I, I fixed it this morning. Yeah, I found this. But, um, and I had... Uh, you could have just rubbed it on the bottom of your shoe. <laughs> so I took that off because, because it was sliding out all the way. Yeah, yeah. While I was playing. Uh -huh. So last night I had a, a, a very informal. Oh, this is the other thing I want to do. I told you there was. I want to do interviews. I want to do these question and answer things. I'm also going to have little one-on-one -on -one jams. Mm -hmm. Oh. Okay. And you and I can do that too. Okay. Right. Um, but I wanted to start with Ricky Diaz. Oh. So I was Rick at, at Ricky Diaz's last night, and we, I had the lights set up and all that stuff. Um, and I'm I'm playing a tune with him, and I I forgot this to put this thing back on. Oh, and it's sliding out. Oh no! And, I, God, I hate that. and I'm playing, and I'm like, 
I think we were playing all of me or something. Oh, wow. I thought, like, why is he in E flat? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember why I'm bringing this up. But um, his daughter posted a little video of you two playing playing duo. That's what we were yesterday. doing. Uh-huh. Is that what you were doing? Okay. So that I I had my my video equipment set up. And, uh-huh. Um, so that will be posting in October. Mm-hmm. But um, no, I don't remember why I brought that up. I don't either. But there's another question. Um, think- Gabriel says my question is: Do you think there are too many influences nowadays on jazz or? So they can damage the original idea, or it can be an advantage for new developments. Um, I don't think. I, I think it can prob- probably be an advantage for new developments. Uh, jazz has always incorporated various other styles, various other kinds of things. Um, it doesn't damage the original idea. It doesn't because it there's, can't. A, there's always guys who are are wanting to play that way you know when uh, when i lived in new york in the 1970s there was a group of guys i never heard them play but there was a group of guys who were strict lenny tristano aficionados wow and that's the way they played well at that point that was 30 year old music everybody thought it was old hat um there was a strong effort among jazz musicians in the um in the 70s to do something new. Uh, fusion music became the the the, uh, the, th- the bandwagon that everybody jumped on to. Uh, it was a new rhythmic feel and, and a new melodic harmonic vocabulary. So everybody jumped on that. And after a while, um, it kind of got to the point that, well, that's today's music, that's the new music. And so those of us who were swing players who played over the swing field, whether it be based on bebop or free music or whatever, that was kind of considered old hat. Right. And and uh, we became anachronisms. But in the late 70s and early 90s, that became to turn, began to turn around. And you found guys who were playing in a traditional style, only a little bit different, but it was still a traditional style. Um and yet the other thing never went away. So you've got fusion jazz, you've got straight, what we call straight ahead jazz. I don't like that term because it's applied to too many different things. You've got free jazz, you have Latin jazz, you know, you have all these different things. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. You know, the original jazz musicians, um, they played, my theory is that what they were really doing was applying ragtime rhythms to the music that they they knew. So they played the blues because they were surrounded by blues, mm-hmm. but they played hymns because they went to church, That's right. you know. That's right. They played marches because they were in high school band. And they played all the popular tunes of the time too. So all of this stuff became part of what they were doing. Right. Uh, and so I don't you know, I don't. I don't think it affects the uh, the original idea, and the original idea is still being taught in the schools. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. So you know what? Wrong with I, it. What I would add to what you're saying: the difference between jazz and classical music is that jazz, the history of jazz, coincides with the history of recordings. That's a very good point. Mm-hmm. So we'll never lose those original. You can't water that down because it's mm-hmm. etched in stone now. Well, also with the with the advent of, of the internet and downloads and YouTube, that's right, and, and Spotify and Apple Music and all that stuff, uh, the whole uh-huh. of the recording experience is up there. I kind of I kind of pity young players because my God, that's going to be overwhelming. But what's happening is a lot of them are discovering older music and going, oh, well, I like that better than I like this, you know. So it's not going to go away, especially with all that stuff available. It's just amazing. That's right. Mm-hmm. Well, and, you know, we do have, so here in Houston, Thomas Hilton yeah. has a band where the idea is to play in the style of the 20s. There have been repertory bands for a long time. When I lived in New York, 
the great bass, bass player, Chuck Israels, led a repertory band. I forget what it was called. Uh, but they they did record copies of things like Fletcher Henderson charts and, and Duke Ellington, of course, and, and older things like that, and then tried to play them as exactly like the originals as it could. So there's always been an interest in that. And yeah, Thomas is doing is doing that quite a bit here. His uh, his Jerry Mulligan quartet was fun. Oh yeah, you played that. No, I didn't. Oh, play you didn't that, play that. No, Carol played that. Oh, Carol. And uh, somebody yeah. else has played it. I don't know. Ralph Stavison has played it. So. So the only thing I did with him on on like that was the um, birth of the cool. Right. I forgot he did that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but the, but it's the the concept is that yes you can you can do that and and he can also quite well play the the modern stuff too. Yeah, yeah. Right. So you yeah, don't he's have very to, versatile guy. You don't have to actually be sold out to only doing uh-huh. the the traditional stuff. I I think of that what you call it repertory. Um, I think of that for me personally as more like. An educational experience. Yeah. For me, I, anyway, like Makes as a sense. player. Sure. If I can get as close to that as I can, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, I don't get a lot, get to do a lot of that. But Well, of course, for many years, we played in 1940s style dance bands all the way up into the 70s and 80s, you know, until they kind of fell by the wayside. And you were expected to, to play as closely as possible within the style. Right. It was very, very difficult for me to play authentic '30s kind of swing solos, right. you know. Uh-huh. But, but I tried my best to do it because whatever the gig is, you have to do the gig. That's You've right. got to do the gig, you know. Whatever the gig calls for, that's what you do. <laughs> or when, else, don't take the gig. When, um, when students ask me about sight reading, yeah. because I'm convinced now that sight reading is more cultural than it is technical. Oh. So, and, and here's what led me to this, right? I was always taught in school that the hardest stuff to sight read was salsa. And at the time, that's what I was doing was playing salsa. Okay. Just a few jazz gigs sprinkled around, uh-huh. you know, but mostly salsa, like two or three gigs a week of salsa and then maybe one a month or one every other month of a jazz thing or classical mm-hmm. thing, mm-hmm. right? Um, and I got so good at reading salsa that if the chart was wrong, I still played it right. Yeah, yeah, sure. Right? Mm-hmm, yeah. And then I got a call for Guy Lombardo, and that kicked my butt. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. So, I, and I'm walking out of there because I, I, I was taught in school, salsa's the hardest one. So I'm thinking Guy Lombardo must be around here somewhere, and Guy Lombardo kicked my butt. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> and I'm walking home, th- I'm driving home thinking, what happened? Yeah. Well, I kept stepping in holes, and uh-huh. and it's because I didn't never listen to Guy Lombardo. Well, probably so, you know. Probably I don't, I don't so. you know, so the, the, the automatic style, you know, because rhythm is really part of the style. Yeah. So well, you're not used to seeing those rhythms because you've ne- you never played the gig, you never well, heard the music before. That's a good point. That's a good point. Um, and mm-hmm. so what I did is, believe it or not, went home because I had some albums, just never listened to them. And I put on the Guy Lombardo stuff and started listening to it. Mm-hmm. And the next time I had a gig like that, they never called me back. I was subbing for EC. Oh, okay. <laughs> and um, they never called me back, but... Um, you know, those gigs come up every once in a while, and mm-hmm. I didn't do so badly the next time. Yeah, I'm sure that's so, true. So I'm convinced that there's a cultural element to the mm-hmm. sight reading. Well, it, it could be. It could be cultural. Because uh, because good sight reading is automatic. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I would. It it always has been for me. I, I have to say that the one thing in my play, and I never had any insecurities about whatsoever, was my ability to read. Uh, and as I said before, it's not true anymore because I just can't sure. see like I used to be able to. Sure. But it never bothered me to jump from one style. As far as reading the rhythms, it never bothered me to jump from one style to another, to another, to another. 
You know, I played in dance bands. I played in a really fine symphonic band in college. And, uh, oh, we played all kinds of stuff. You know, we played a lot of contemporary uh, music written for a band. Uh, so that was one thing. Then I play in a dance band. Then I play in a jazz band. When I first started playing salsa, I, I didn't think, uh, so did, I, didn't have any trouble. I with think it. that is one big difference between you and me. I've always struggled with salsa. Have you? Yeah. Always, 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 always. And oh. in fact, there were times that you and I played together, and I'm like in those early years. I'm like, oh, they're never going to call me back again. Oh, no, no. <laughs> Especially with Buddy. Oh, well. Yeah. So, <laughs> buddy, buddy used to, so we when I first started playing big band gigs, um, it was always Dennis on second, Buddy on first, and me on the third court. And Buddy would be telling me a joke and tell the punchline right before the entrance. Yeah, yeah. He was great about it. He never missed the entrance. Never. He so I'm, I, blue I'll start and laughing bang. and then realize these guys are playing already. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so he would talk a blue streak on the job. He would just never stop. The band leader that uh, that we played with would get so mad at him because he just wouldn't shut up. He's, he's in my <laughs> left ear the whole time. And, you know, I'm tried to not to be rude, so I'd talk to him a little bit. But he got on a thing one time about buying silver. He's telling me that I need to invest in silver. And he would not let it go gig after gig. <laughs> you know, boy, silver right now is up to blah, 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 per, per, yeah. per ounce. You, know, and you really need to put some money. You need to you know, on and on and on and on. I couldn't figure out how to stop it. Finally, I had a brainstorm one night, and I said, buddy. I can't even buy food. And he said, oh, okay. <laughs> and then he left me alone. We never, oh, we man. never talked about silver mm. anymore. <laughs> That's funny. But I've known guys like that. They're just, you know, right up until the time of the entrance, they're, they're busy doing something uh -huh. or they're talking or something. And then it's like, boom. And they're right there. You know, if you know the book, sure. Right. Sure. Yeah. And that's the thing. He'd been playing that book so long. It was second nature to him. He knew exactly how much time he had to play. I think out of so all he never my, missed it. I think out of all my years, all the gigs I've played. Now I have I have um sections that I remember that I enjoyed more musically. Yeah. But I think the the and maybe it's because of the was the first professional big bands I ever played with, uh -huh. right? at least here locally. Um, I have very, very fond memories of that section. Yeah, Ed Gerlach's band. Yeah. Well, also Ricky. Oh, yeah, and Ricky. Yeah, and Ricky's band, which would essentially be the same section plus one. Right. Because he used four trumpets. So three. when I first started playing with Ricky, I think the third trumpet was EC. Oh, okay. And I was playing fourth. I never played a Ricky Span with EC. Maybe, no. I don't think I. Did. I, don't, I might be remembering that wrong, uh -huh. but I remember I started off on the fourth chair, mm -hmm. and then after a while I was up on the third chair, and that I think I was third chair for a long, long, long time. Uh -huh. Um, and then um, then and that was the same section for Gerlach. Yeah. 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 Well, there was a limited pool of good players in town those days. It's not so much anymore. There's a bunch of young guys now who just play really good. You know, so yeah. they're getting all the work. I'm out of gigs. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so. <laughs> but yeah. I still play my little trio gigs. You know, that's uh -huh. that's the main thing. And uh, Is that with Tiana? Yeah, that's with okay, Tiana. Okay, good. Yeah. I just didn't mention her name because I didn't figure anybody knew her. But yeah, I play play a few of those. We did one yesterday downtown, me and her and a guitar player wow. at a food court. Um, and tonight is at Artisan's Restaurant. Okay. It'll be her and I and Greg Petito. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's with her. She's so... um. What I'd like to do, oh, let's see here. Eddie, a question from my wife. Okay. If there's some more time, how 
do you see the relationship between jazz music and today's society? Hmm. Hmm. Between the jazz music and today's society? I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Oh. Uh, so, what do you mean? Yeah, can you clarify that a little more? Yeah. So, while we're waiting for him to clarify, um, I, I'm assuming you're still taking students? Yeah. So, um, when this is over, would you like me to put uh, a link with your email, or do you not want to make that public? Yeah, or? sure, that's fine. That doesn't bother me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, I've well, got, I have seven now. I have four one hours and three half hours. And uh, that's essentially enough for me, but I'd take one or two more. I just try like like to get them all done in two days. I have Social Security and I have a couple little pensions. So uh, my bills are all paid and the students are extra money. Oh, okay. And it's good. great. You know, it's great. It works real good so far. But sure, I'll take on another one or two. So I'll put your your email. You don't have a website? No. Okay. I'll put your email in... Um, in the description below so that they can contact you if they want lessons. I see Gabriel started to clarify it, but then he stopped, so I'm not sure. Relationship between jazz music and today's society. I wonder if he's talking about how people, non-musicians, think of the music. Yeah, I don't know. Um, well, it's, still, it's still kind of underground. It's still kind of underground. There, there are small jazz... Uh, uh, small groups of jazz fans, um, but it's still kind of underground. And um, I think, let's see, here we go. Do you think jazz music can influence today's society in a good way, not like punks and other kind of music? Well, it, it could if people listen to it, but they don't. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm not sure that it can, you know, as I said, it's still kind of underground. It just goes on of its own, uh, in its own momentum. And um, I don't feel it has much to do with society or society has much to do with us. I joke sometimes about these little trio gigs uh, being my favorite kind of gig. We don't bother us, but we don't bother them. They don't bother us. <laughs> We just kind of off in, the corner, oh, off in the corner playing to ourselves. You know, I'm totally fine with that. I don't have to, I don't feel an urge to please anybody. They say art is all about communication. And not to me, it is. You know, I don't, I just, it's it's about the game. It's about the game of playing. You remind me of, <clears> of <throat> so back when I was still teaching at HSPVA, they had Tim Hagens as a guest uh -huh. speaker. Uh -huh. And one of those master classes, right? Yeah, yeah. And someone asked him about his album, and he, he said that they he he described a, a, a thing with his audible architecture. Yeah, that's a that great album? album. Yes, is that they bulldozed a whole bunch of them on the floor of the because they needed the space for their albums. Wait a minute, did what? Yeah, they bolt, they put it in the middle of the warehouse with a, a oh, steam roll. Warehouse, oh, okay, they put a steam roll over them so that you know. Well, economics drives everything. So, that that album was not going to sell, and people go, <gasps> and he goes, Oh, no, no, he says, Music industry, this is this is the part that's relevant. He says, The music industry is big business. He says, Jazz trumpet, that's little business. Yeah, that's, very, that's very little business. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, I can imagine that a lot of musicians, a lot of good musicians, wouldn't buy that album because it's so experimental. It's so, I, I think it's brilliant. Oh, I like it. I just think it's a great album. I love it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if you're going to, if you're going to go that route, then you have to, to, or you just even be any kind of jazz musician, you have to tell yourself that. It's not going to be popular. You're not going to make a lot of money at it. That's right. But if you work, if you work it right, you can make a living. You can do it all your life, you know, and you can have a lot of rewards and and uh, a really good time playing music. I had a student one time. No, 
he was in elementary school, right? But I, I love this story. He says, um, I want to be a jazz trumpet player. I said, well, why do you want to do that? He says, I want to be rich and famous. <laughs> oh, <boy. laughs> I, I, you know, I'm going to say his name because you probably know him. Um, and I don't think he would be offended by that. It was Elijah Michel. You ever heard? What is that? Ever? Elijah Michel. I have heard that name. I don't don't think I know him. So he's at, I think, um, the new school now. Okay. Oh, good for him. Yeah. That's a good place to be. So, um, but he knows better to th than to think that he's going to be rich and famous. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I know who that is. I, I ran into him just recently. Okay. Yeah. Ray Vega came to town. Okay. And um, uh, Jose Diaz put a thing together with Ray. Right. Ray he Vega. used to play with, with the group. So Go I went up there and Elijah was, he, he sat in, was playing with him. Okay. And, um, How's he sounding? Was that recent? Yeah, he sounded real good. It was okay, very good. interesting. Very, very, uh, very venturesome. Um, and I, you know, I went to him and I told him, I said, man, I enjoyed your playing, you know, and I introduced him my name. He said, oh, yeah, we've met. You know, I've known you for a long time. We're Facebook friends. And I'm oh, like, good. oh, I'm embarrassed. So I, I didn't him, realize, but yeah. I taught him from like fourth grade to graduating high school. Oh, no kidding. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. Very nice fellow. Yeah. yeah. His brother is also a, a musician. Mm -hmm. um, Clifford. Okay. I don't know. Clifford, um, Clifford Gordon. Oh, okay, different name. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I, I've met him. Tenor player. I've met him, yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. I know of him. I can't remember from where now, but I do. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So, yeah, that, that's that, that's the when I asked, because I, I do this thing that, well, that I do with all students because I want to be a goal-oriented teacher. Yeah. So I can't be goal-oriented if they don't tell me what it is they want to do. Oh, I see. Right. So I asked them, "What is? What do you want to do? What? 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 Is, you know?" And they said, "I want to." That's what Elijah said. I want to be a jazz trumpet player. And okay. I said, why, why do you want to do that? <laughs> be rich and famous. You're probably a more more um, versatile teacher than I am. I figure if they come to me, it's because they won't. And that's the, Do you know what? That's the way it should be. Although. I admit I do have some some high school kids who were recommended to me, and you know they didn't they don't know anything. They're I don't mean it that way. I mean they're just trying to play their music. That's right. So um, they got with me strictly by accident. You know. So I I don't know. I don't know. I think that happens a lot. Mm -hmm. But in terms of improvisation, I figure, you know, I've got what I can show them, which is what I can do. And that's all I can show them. And there's a lot of people who would approach it differently and uh, uh, inform them of a lot of things that I either don't know about or I'm not very good at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you worked, didn't you teach um, another HSPVA kid, but much farther back? He was a great player now, professional, teaches university too. I get their names mixed up. Uh, Brandon, huh? Brandon, Brandon Lee. Brandon Lee. Yeah, his dad brought me to him. Or brought him to me when he was a freshman in high school, and I was just bowled over. Now, he stayed with me for two years, and finally, I we went through all the real books and uh, got him into the the Tom Harrell, uh, Abersol play along. Oh, okay, nice. Learn some really advanced tunes. And finally, I just had to tell him, man, I can't show you anything anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, I think you should just go study. Yeah. So now he's got, is he like with Blue Note or something like that? Didn't he sign with a label? He did play, he did do Blue Note. I don't know if he's still on the label or not. You know, that label has changed. Oh, really? Yeah. Bruce Lundvall, I believe, was the primary okay. producer. And uh, uh, he left or he died. He died. That's what it was. He died, and the new producer is is changing the style of Blue Note. So it's not, I see. It's not like the old Blue Note. Joe Lovato had been on Blue Note for many many years, and he jumped off. 
He said, oh. no, I, I don't want to do this. So he's with the, uh, the European label. Why am I drawing a blank? Uh, Manfred Eicher's label. Sega? Manfred Eicher's oh, I don't know. label. Uh, M. <laughs> oh, man. It's a drag getting old. Anyway, anyway. Blue Note has changed. I don't know if Brandon's still with him or not. But uh, he's play, he's been playing with the uh, <clears throat> the uh, Count Basie band now. Oh, okay. He just did a recording with him recently. And uh, he also uh, has been doing a lot of stuff on his own, of course. Uh, and he played with the Blue Note, not the Blue Note, the Birdland Big Band. Oh, wow, nice. And I think he played a little bit with the, the Vanguard Monday Night Big Band. I don't know if he did that regularly okay. or steadily. But yeah, he's had a good career. He's had a good career. Um, one of the things that helped him out <clears throat> was... When, uh, when Marsalis and the Lincoln Center Orchestra did uh, the essentially Ellington Festival, right. I believe Brandon was a senior, um, and went and heard him play. And uh, there was a video of it. And he started walking across the stage and went and says to him, you can play, man. Mm -hmm. You can play. Then he said, he's real quiet, too. You know, I thought, yeah, yeah that's him. So anyway, he got went in his corner right away that was the next year when Brandon uh, graduated that the Juilliard school established a, uh, a jazz program because they'd yeah. never had one before. So he got a free ride to Juilliard. Can you imagine? Wow. A free ride to Juilliard. And when he graduated, he was on the teaching staff there for a while doing one of the big bands or something. I don't, I don't think he still does that. I think he went to another state Took a job as a teacher in another state. Decided he didn't want to do that. Oh, something. so he's not teaching them anymore. I don't. Oh, okay. Don't don't quote me. Don't quote me. I may be wrong. Okay. Yeah. Well, very good. That was Brandon. So let's go ahead and take one question if you guys have, and um, otherwise we'll just close this down. All right. I'm glad you guys hung out with us this long. Yeah, me too. Thank you, fellas. Wow. I've enjoyed this. I so hope some of it's been informative to you. Yeah, there we go. It was a great honor for me to see you in live Q and A. <laughs> Thanks oh, for everything, Mr. Dotson. You are one of my wife and me musical hero. Oh, Thanks, man. Eddie. This was great, Gabriel. Right. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I really do. Yeah. yeah well, I much. guess with that said, we'll close it down. Um, okay. Thank you, guys. We're going to do more of these. It won't be every time because there are people that want to know about my methods. So that's primarily what this is. Yeah. Um, but um, but I do want to have other people, like just like what we're doing. Yeah. Oh, and, this is great fun. Um, what a resource. I mean, yeah. you know. And like I said, these stay up. Uh now, what I was doing in the past was making them not private, but unlisted so that people would have to go to my website to see oh, that. I, see. Uh -huh. I changed my mind about that. I'm going to go back okay. now and make them all public again. Uh -huh. Yeah. This is number 109. Wow. No kidding. Yeah. Great. Uh-huh. Thanks to COVID. Yeah. Uh, okay. COVID, COVID ended up doing that with a lot of people. You know, Vincent Gardner had one he was doing every week. Uh, Woody Witt had one he was doing uh -huh. every week. They were totally different kinds of things, you know, but yeah, doing COVID, they so were doing that. What I tell them is um, on a day that I don't have a gig, even though this wouldn't necessarily conflict with the gig, I don't want to have to do this and then go to, mm -hmm. like, a, like if I have to leave the house at four or whatever. Yeah, right. Um, I don't want to have to do that. Oh, sure. You know, there's other stuff I have to do. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but yes, when we don't, when I don't have a gig on Friday, but it, since COVID hit, I mean, it's been almost every week that I've done this. Yeah. You well, know? it it almost, I thought it was going to destroy the music business, but it's coming back now, a little by little by little. There are things that I used to do as a musician that don't exist anymore. 
certain kinds of jobs right. that I had. You know, the big dance band, for one thing. Right. Uh, also, the shows that I've mentioned before mm-hmm. that came in from time to time. And a lot, that was that stuff was on the way out long before the sure. COVID and the lockdown. Sure. Things change. Uh, musical taste change in the public. And, you know, so right. things fall by the wayside. If there are recordings, they're still around, you know, but the That's job, right. but the jobs aren't. So, all right, guys, we're going to call it quits. Um, God bless you all. And we will see you next week, probably, because so far I don't have a gig next week. All right. Thank you, everyone. Best of luck to all of you. I've right. enjoyed this enormously. I hope you got something Good. out of it. All right. Well, thank you. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Cool. Cool.